so that I can chat if anyone tunes in today. It's going to be a super casual stream today. We're going to be checking out Beatmaker 3 on the iPad. We're going to be writing some chilled out dubby techno beats today inside of Beatmaker 3. Go ahead and try to find this stream on my channel. Okay, good deal. For those of you who aren't familiar with Beatmaker 3 on iPad, this is a full, uh, complete DAW allowing you to build anything from live jams to full, complete, and finished tracks. We're going to go ahead and take a listen to what I've currently got uh, built in here right now. It's going to get a little bit loud in 3, 2, 1. Hey, hey, what's happening? Sky Tortoise Ferryman, can you hear that okay? Can you hear my voice okay? Is anything too loud or not loud enough? Hey, hey, Jeremy. All right. listening to now is just a dub techno groove that I put together uh, last night inside of Beatmaker 3. We're currently at 140 beats per minute, pretty up-tempo uh, uh, tempo for this uh, type of genre. Let's go ahead and mute some of these tracks so that I can show you the individual elements that are making up this groove here. For those of you who aren't familiar with Beatmaker 3, Beatmaker 3 by default uh, allows us to load banks. Um, we can load uh, as many banks as, as the iPad will handle. And in these banks, we can load uh, samples or we can load virtual instruments and effects. Currently, I've got 16 one-shot samples, just samples from my sample packs from electronasounds.com, uh, creating this groove here. And we'll start out with just a kick sample. Pretty thundering kick sample. I believe that one's from my Velvet Carbon Techno sample pack. Bring in a little bit of a bass sound. Hey, hey, Robbie. Good to see you in the chat. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We add in a little bit of percussion sound to that groove. A little bit of a hi-hat. Some more hi-hat. I find that by layering different hi-hat samples and by layering different samples in general really helps me to get where I want to go. Add a clap. Hey, hey, Marcus. Thanks for tuning in. Let's add a big chord stab over the top of this, shall we? This is sort of acting as a big downbeat stab. It's going to trigger that chord stab every eight bars. So one, two, three, four. We can make the rhythm a little bit more complex by adding in a shaker. Sort of flesh out the high frequency content here. And over this full groove, we can add a large chord line that I've created using five different samples. This is the type of groove that we're going to be creating today from scratch. So if you're into this dubby techno kind of sound, be sure to stick around. So 
So I started this groove by coming up with this sort of rhythmic and melodic pattern using a bunch of different chord samples. And this is exactly what we're going to be working on today. Hey, hey, we got Meerkat Music in the chat. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to try to go really slow today. For those of you who aren't familiar with Beatmaker 3, I'm going to try to be uh, super beginner friendly today. And I'm going to try to talk through um, not only everything that I'm doing, but specifically why I'm doing um, every step along the way as well. So I think the very first thing that we'll need to do today is go ahead and just open up a new session inside of Beatmaker 3. So we'll go ahead and do that. By default, what we get is we get uh, one bank of pads that we can either load a virtual instrument onto or load samples onto. I personally uh, am a really big uh, proponent for the sample-based workflow, especially um, as I'm a sample maker, and I like to use my own samples a lot inside of Beatmaker 3. That's what we're going to be working with today. We're going to go uh, slow to get started, and we're going to try to create a really groovy um, chord pattern that we can use um, to create a, a really nice dubby groove around. The first thing I think we'll do is go ahead and change our tempo today. The groove we were just listening to was at 140 beats per minute. I think we'll go a little bit slower today so we can really maybe emphasize some groove inside of this one today. And we're going to start out today, I think, at 132 beats per minute. Now, you'll need to have some samples already loaded inside of Beatmaker 3, and I have quite a few samples here, so if I go up to the Options window, and I click on the Folder tab, and I go to the Imports folder, this is where I've got my samples stored inside of Beatmaker 3. I've got a folder for the Electrona Sounds sample packs here, and I can just start scrolling through some of these samples. Uh, I've actually got a pack that I'm working on currently, which is a whole bunch of, you know, more or chords uh, s samples, and I think that we're going to dig into these unreleased samples today and start working with these and see what we can come up with. I have a folder here of some chords that I've sampled out of the quasi-midi series. Maybe we'll dig in here. Um, let's see, it maybe about these here, what we like. Fantastic. What I've got here is I've got um, eight different variations of an F minor chord stab. These are ever so gently different from each other if you listen really carefully. So what let's go ahead and do is just drag some of these over to the Beatmaker 3 pad, shall we? Let me get number four here. I think I've got two twice. Fantastic. So we start out with four different chord samples, and I can go back into this folder and grab more chord samples as we need to. But I think to start off with today, this is going to do it for us. Hey, hey, we got Alpo in the chat as well. Hey, Sean. All right. Let's see here. It's going to be a slow one today. I don't work uh, with Beatmaker 3 uh, all the time these days, um, but I did get back into it yesterday to get a little bit more familiar uh, so that hopefully we'll get through this stream without too much difficulty. Uh, for those of you who might be tuning in uh, for a Eurorack patch lab, I'm um, sorry, but we had to take a two-week uh, break on the Eurorack sessions because I am currently putting together a 20-minute live set using uh, the Eurorack system. And that set uh, is coming up, actually, it's coming up this Tuesday on the channel. There'll be a live stream at 1 p.m., Pacific Standard uh, Time on the channel where I'll be doing that live set. That's for uh, a four-day online music festival called Clown Fest 4. It's the fourth installment of the Cl uh, Clown Fest online music festival this week. So if you're interested in that, check that out on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'll be doing that live stream. Okay, let's go ahead and get back into these chords, shall we? The level of the audio is always a little bit, um, you know, tenuous until we actually get a groove started that I can actually work with. Now, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Beatmaker 3, 
I said earlier that how Beatmaker 3 is a complete and fully fledged DAW that will allow you to create anything from live jams or fully fleshed out tracks. And it's very similar to working with a large DAW like Ableton. It's very, very deep and you can approach it a lot of different ways. If we go over to this, to actually, let me uh, assume that you guys have never seen this app before at all, right? We can set um, our tempo up here at the top, and then down here at the left, there's four buttons that cycle through the screen, uh, the four major screen layouts that you're going to be working with inside of Beatmaker 3. So up at the top here, here's our main layout where we can see the pads, and we can tap on those to get sound. If we click down to the next level, each individual pad has a full and complete robust sampler attached to it. We can change the tuning of any of our samples, we can change the gain, we can pitch stretch these, we can assign them to envelopes, filters, um, we can even use a saturation, we can adjust the panning on each sound individually. We can even load individual effects onto each sound individually as needed, and we'll be doing that uh, in a little bit uh, today as well. So let's see here. The next screen down is the timeline screen, and this is basically like any other timeline in any other DAW that you may be familiar with. It goes from left to right, and we just you know can write a song, uh, put our patterns in along the timeline as needed. Then down here on the fourth tab, excuse me, we have a mixer section, section which will um, expand as we continue loading other banks. But for now, we're going to go ahead and be working with just a one bank workflow. Hey, hey, Hayden. Hey, hey, Jamie. Hey, 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 Wayne. All right, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Let's see here. What we're going to do first. Um, I don't think it has trouble remembering the plugin settings per se, but we're going to get to that, Nick. Um, today we're going to be doing, uh, for the most part, a sample based workflow inside of Beatmaker 3, and we're not going to be using a lot of virtual instruments per se. If we do use any virtual instruments, we'll be rendering uh, that content to audio. I basically use Beatmaker 3 um, as a sample. Um, based workflow, and I really don't have a lot of bugs um, or, or glitches using it in this way. And we're going to discuss that concept a little further as we continue building today as well. I think what we'll do is maybe go ahead and turn the metronome on here and just hit play. Cool. And I think what I'll do is maybe just tap in a pattern randomly, sort of, you know, um, in a rhythm with the metronome here. Let's go ahead and uh, hit record. Let's go with that for now. And if I go into the, let's see here, if I go into the uh, playlist uh, section of the app here, and I double click on that little pattern that we just created, I can see the actual notes here on a typical piano uh, roll style grid. And we can see that the samples are labeled here as well. So here we're triggering an F minor one, F minor two, F minor three, and F minor five. Here we can start moving these notes around if we want. We can turn that metronome off. But I think before we go any further, the first thing we'll do is make it so that every time one of these uh, samples hits, that it turns off any other of the four samples that might be playing. We can go down to the second tab here, and we can assign each of these sounds to its own choke group. Down here on the left, there's a section for that, so if we click the sample, and we assign each of these samples to choke group number one, now, every time I hit a sample, it will turn off any other sample in that choke group that's playing. That sounds a little bit like this. You see how none of the samples are ringing out? They're literally cutting each other off. Cool. 
bring the volume down on that fourth sample. Better. And let's do a little bit of panning on these first ones to make them a little bit more interesting. Let's pan that first sample, let's say 5% to the left, and pan this next sample, let's say 10% to the right, and get a little bit of stereo movement here. I'm not sure how much of this you'll hear over the live stream, and these are very subtle um, differences, but these are the kind of subtle differences that really add up in your mix. If you create an entire uh, track with, say, you know, 30 or 40 different tracks going in it, and every single track is just panned straight up the middle, your stereo field is going to be a little bit, um, you know, um, busy, per se. So I like to do even those subtle 4 or 5% pannings to help get a little bit of stereo width in your mix can be really helpful. Hey, thanks for tuning in, Bongo Jack. What's happening, Russ? Hey, we got Spider Ice Midas in the chat. What let's go ahead and do is let's make this pattern a little bit more interesting than just a standard two bar uh, loop, shall we? If we, let's see here, if I can show this to you. If we click where it says playing song, it's kind of an odd window sometimes, depending on where you are um, in the system. But we've got our bank highlight, highlighted, and I click playing song uh, up here, which brings up our patterns inside of bank one. We currently only have the one pattern, but I can click on these three bars and I can change the duration. I know I'm probably going a little bit fast now. This is um, a, a full a full DAW that's going to allow us to literally do everything um, that you would be able to do in a, in a full and robust DAW. Um, so feel free to watch this stream back and pause as needed. Um, but we're going to go ahead and just you know click the three bars and make the pattern duration a four bar pattern instead of a two bar pattern. Now, if we go back to the third tab and we're open up in our our window here, actually, let me in our whoops in our song tab, I'm going to go ahead and bring our loop brace out to a full four bars. So now it's got measure one, two, three, and four uh, highlighted in our loop. And if I double click the loop now, it's going to open it up, and it's going to know that it's a four-bar loop. What I'd like to do is copy this first bit of content over to the second half of the loop. So I'm going to change from the uh, pencil tool over to the highlight tool by clicking the highlight tool down here at the bottom. And now I can just click and drag, you know. I can take these notes. And I can just move them where I want to. Um, that didn't really get me where I wanted to go, so I'm going to go undo. And rather than just drag those, we're going to go ahead and click duplicate. That's going to, you know, actually duplicate the notes. If you hold on these highlighted notes, it will zoom in so that you can really see exactly where on the uh, grid you're dropping those notes. And I find this kind of a workflow really easy. It takes a little bit of time to get used to all this pinching and zooming. But once you do, it's really easy to either, you know, sc uh, scroll out and get a really wide look at your um, notes or to zoom in and get some finite control over um, your notes. We're currently on a 1 16th note grid, but if you wanted to, like, maybe put in longer notes instead, you could really easily change the grid to like a one bar grid. Okay. Let's zoom in on the end part here. And maybe this might be a good opportunity actually to bring in another chord sample for a variation. Cool, let's bring in that one. And I think we're going to bring the level on that down quite a bit. Maybe pan it the tiniest little bit to the right by default. Cool. Now, if I go back to our pattern, it's on pad 9. So, pad 9 down here. 
A lot of times it takes a little bit of time for Beatmaker 3 to catch up in this um, labeling window. It currently thinks on this side that pad 9 is empty, but there's actually a sample there. Um, once we go back and forth a few more times, it'll kind of fill that, it'll populate that with the actual name of the sample. Go back to the pencil tool and put in an extra note there and maybe here. And that's kind of neat. But what let's do is on that new chord stab that we just put in, let's make it a really short stab, shall we? So if I uh, take a look at the sample page, you know, if I click the pad, we get an individual sample page for each sample that we're working with. So for this new sound, I'd like it to be a lot shorter. So we can literally just take the end point of this sample and drag it this way until it's a lot shorter. That sounds better. Awesome. And let's go ahead and put a high pass filter on this new sound as well. This is a really nice feature inside of Beatmaker 3 when you're using the workflow like I'm showing you here, where we're just dragging and dropping samples to the pads. Each pad has the uh, ability to turn on um, a filter, and you can choose between low pass, high pass, band pass, um, all those, you know options like low shelf filter, high shelf filter, a peak filter, a notch filter. Really robust here actually, but we're going to go with just a high pass filter on just this one sound. So all of the other sounds are kept the same, but this pad here, do you hear how we're able to filter that one pad? Alright, let's go ahead and bring the volume up on that one just a tiny little bit more now that we've done the adjusting to the uh, high pass frequency there. This, I think um, these chords might sound a little bit dreamy if we were able to run them through a reverb. So let's go ahead and get that set up at this time. But before we do that, let's go ahead and start the saving process. I'm a really big proponent of over saving. I like to save a lot. That way, if anything goes wrong inside of the application, you've always got you know your last save to go back to. So let's go ahead and get this saved to a project at this time. If I click the Save button, it's going to bring up the option for me to go ahead and name this session because we haven't yet. So let's just go ahead and call this BM3 W tutorial for today. Great. Okay, and now I can start saving this all the time. All we have to do is just click this Save button in the upper right-hand corner. Let's see here. If we go over to the Menu section, we'll see that what we've got here is we've got a channel for our main out. So all of the banks that we load will all be routed to the main output. And we've also got an Auxiliary 1 and an Auxiliary 2. We actually have uh, the ability to uh, create more auxiliary sends, but I don't often need those, and I don't believe we'll be worrying about that today. But what I want to do is I want to go ahead and create a reverb send so that we can send these chord samples to some extra reverb. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight the auxiliary one, the send here, and I'm going to click down at the bottom left where it says audio effects. Now because I have the auxiliary one channel highlighted, it's brought that up on the left, but we can change what channel we're working with by either highlighting up here at the top, or we can just sort of click in the title bar over here, and we can select what we're working with. So if we want to work with bank one, or if we want to work with, you know, auxiliary one, just make sure that your um, title up at the top here is representative of the channel that you want to actually put the effects on. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and put um, a reverb here. So we're going to choose, um, I don't know, let's choose, um, yeah, I really, hmm, I really do like, um, 
the EOS 2 reverb from Audio Damage. I think we'll just choose that one today. And what I also like to do on a reverb send or a delay send, either in Ableton or Beatmaker 3 or uh, the Akai Force for that matter, is when you're um, sending your sounds through the reverb or the delay, I typically don't want a lot of low end frequency content to come through here. I don't want to put um, like reverb on the low frequencies um, of our low frequency content per se, because that's going to create a little bit of mud um, and not be super, super clear to listen to. So we can get around that mud by just high pass filtering the content that goes into the reverb. And here's what we're going to do. Let's just go ahead and take... Um, Let's just take the default EQ from Beatmaker 3. While we're here, let me show you that actually. Um, we've got quite a few built-in effects to Beatmaker 3, which are absolutely usable. We've got an EQ, we've got an auto pan, this bit crusher, delay, we've got a compressor, which we can use uh, for side chaining if we want, or as a standard compressor. We've got reverb, delay, overdrive, phasers, filters, saturators, slicers, and wideners. Quite a robust amount of built-in effects to this app. But what we're going to do is we're literally just going to remove any frequencies below around 600 hertz so that no frequencies that are in that bass sort of area um, come through the reverb. We're going to make this, a re, uh, this EQ happen in the chain before it goes into the actual reverb plugin. So we'll use the three dots here and we'll choose move up. And now in the chain, the six band EQ is coming first and I've just put a high pass filter on it to remove any frequencies below 600 hertz. Now I can go ahead and bring up the reverb plugin itself. And what we can do is back in the mixer here, we can go to bank one. And if I, let me do that again. So here's our mixer section. And if I double tap on bank one, it shows um, a channel for every single pad that we've dropped a sample onto. If we continue dropping more samples into this bank, there will uh, start to be more channels in this mixer view here. But for default, I think we'll just go ahead and these chord samples we've got loaded, I'm just gonna push up the send one evenly on those to, I don't know, an arbitrary amount. And let's see what starts to happen here. Those of you who are familiar with my channel, you know that I typically like way too much reverb. Today's probably not going to be a lot different. I'm probably going to give it a go. I like the way that's sounding. That's just giving us a tiny little bit of extra little bit of reverb on our sounds uh, so far. And it's only assigned to these chords uh, samples. So any other uh, samples that we continue to drag and drop onto this bank are not going to be uh, routed to that reverb by default. Now, you may be saying right off the jump, Dean, I'm going to fill up these 16 pads with sounds in just a few seconds, and then what do we do? We'll just keep adding more banks and whatnot. Well, that's definitely a way to approach it, but have no fear, because we can actually load uh, 128 samples uh, in each bank. We've got a little section here where we can actually just start scrolling up through pages of pads, and we can get all the way up to 128 samples. We can even change the layout of the sampler window itself from a 16-pad layout to a 64-pad layout, and you can drag and drop onto this sort of a view as well, the same way that you would with the other view. Let's go ahead and add something else at this time, shall we? Maybe go ahead and find a kick drum that might start gelling with these chords. Um, I want to make sure, though, that it's not going to be super, super loud before we get uh, going, though. So I'm going to do a setting here. I'm going to click on the gear icon, and then we're going to Look at the top. We've got three different tabs for the settings of the app. We've got an audio, midding, audio MIDI settings. We've got some focus actions settings, which we're probably not going to get into today. And then we have some audio settings. Down over here, you can actually set the level that the audio previews are going to be.
What that means is that when I've got these samples open on the left hand side and I'm clicking them to hear them so I can drag them onto a pad, sometimes they can be a little bit too quiet as you're trying to hear them or sometimes they can be a lot too loud when you're trying to hear them. You can set this level here to compensate for that. Just raise it up if they're too quiet or bring it down if they're too loud. I'll go ahead and just play this pattern. And let's see here. Maybe we'll go into my ve uh, Velvet Carbon Techno samples. These are just some kick drum samples from that sample pack. Ooh, that's kind of nice. Yeah, that's kind of a big, big kick. I like that. Maybe what we'll do to make it a little bit less huge is bring the sustain down on this a little bit. One of the benefits uh, to using this app, rather than just dragging your one shots uh, onto the timeline directly, like if you were just dropping different loops and whatnot on the timeline, you don't get um, the sampler controls that you do when you're dropping the samples onto these pads here. So if I highlight that, and then we click the second um, option here to bring up the sampler page, we can do all sorts of things. We can bring down the gain. But what I really want to do is I want to take uh, the sample from a one shot to um, a hold. And what that means is that I will have control over the way the sample plays back using these envelope controls now. And what I can do is I can bring the sustain down on the envelope for this kick drum so that it'll play the transient of the kick drum as is. But you see this big bulbous section here? It's going to sort of reduce the volume on just that section of the kick drum. We can make that um, really distinct so you can hear what I'm saying if I start bringing that all the way down. See how it tightens up the kick drum by changing the envelope? So we can really control sort of how loud and how beefy this kick drum is by using the envelope. There's a couple of ways that we could go ahead and put this kick drum sound in. We could go ahead and hit record and just punch it in manually. Or we can go back to the song page here, and I can double click on the pattern itself. Now it's just that super easy pinch and zoom, right? Now we've got it um, uh, noting here which, which samples are in what slots. So it says, you know, slot one, here's our kick drum. And basically, all I want the kick drum to do is just be a four on the floor kick drum. So if I put in a quarter note um, here, and then we just duplicate this out a whole bunch of times. We'll go ahead and be uh, putting that kick drum in. That's one too many, so we'll delete that. Let's bring the sustain on that kick drum down a little bit more and tighten it up a little, shall we? It's a really robust techno kick. And I may be looking for something a little bit more um, tame, per se, for this session. I think this is a great uh, opportunity to show you the editor inside of Beatmaker 3 at this time. Each, um, each pad here not only features a full uh, sample playback system. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the old Akai hardware rack mount samplers, this is very similar to that sort of a workflow and that sort of um, environment. But what we can do is we can click Edit, and we can get into a really robust um, audio editing system here inside of Beatmaker 3. What I can do is I can highlight any part of the sample that I want to work with, or I can leave it all highlighted. But what I want to do is I want to leave this initial transient part of the sample intact, and I want to just sort of tame this ending tail of the kick drum so it's not such a loud, meaty, robust, booming techno kick drum, but a little bit more of a tamed kick drum so that our chords uh, in this groove can take a little bit more of the focal point. So what we'll do is we'll just hit process. You'll notice that this is uh, a lot like a Akai MPC live workflow and that you really can get in here and do a lot of editing on your samples. But what we're going to do is just fade out. So we're just going to fade out this end portion of the sample. In fact, I think I'll do that twice. Fade out. Do you see how we sort of tamed this end of the sample a little bit? 
Fantastic. Now, this is a step that a lot of people don't realize they need to do, and it will uh, it can create missing samples in your projects if you don't do this final step now that we've gone ahead and edited the sample. You want to go ahead and click these three dots here up on the right, and you want to make sure that you're saving the new sample. We're going to go ahead and just save this into um, the same directory that we're working with at this time. It will allow us to give a new name to the sample if we want. I'm just going to call this Kick Edited, and there we have it. Now, if you don't do that step, sometimes Beatmaker 3 can lose that sample that you've worked with. It might not know how to store it quite right, um, and you'll end up with issues there. What you want to do is there we go, save. You realize that we're, uh, you, you remember that I've already given the project a name and saved it. And at this point, since we're working with some samples and I've gone ahead and you know created a new version of samples, let's go ahead and exit out of the program. And we'll just restart the program again. And we'll just load that same session. Now, why am I doing this exactly? This is part of my workflow, friends. I do this every so often inside of the app to make sure that if it is going to have any issues with the samples or maybe not filing them correctly, that I will find out um, you know, early on in the session. You don't want to spend eight hours and then close it out and come back tomorrow and maybe find out that it's missing sample number two if you get my drift. And that can happen if you're not really careful with the way that you're working with the app. So let's go ahead and um, BM3 W tutorial. That's us. Cool. We'll go ahead and load that up. And all of the samples are here because I did everything the way we needed to do. I just wanted to make sure that I bring that to your attention. It's a definite um, a good thing to you know close the app, reload it sometimes, and make sure that it's got all of your samples, especially if you're doing a lot of editing and saving of new sounds. Go back to a 16 pad view and make it a little cleaner. I think at this time, we'll go ahead and put a limiter on the master bus. This is just going to help protect our ears, our headphones, and our speakers. We're going to go ahead and go to the mixing section, which is the fourth tab down on the left. I know I'm probably going a little bit fast today. Um, I was really trying to keep this beginner friendly, but I see we're already 37 minutes into the stream and I haven't gotten much created. So I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker while still explaining everything along the way. We're going to go ahead and click that main out track so we can highlight it. And we're going to click audio effects. May as well tap that save button while we're here, right? Let's go ahead and make sure we've got the main out tab open. We'll click add audio effect. Now here we can choose to add either the effects that come standard in Beatmaker 3 or any audio unit um, or inter-app audio effects that you've got in your iPad. Uh, I think somebody asked earlier, this is a 2018 um, iPad Pro. Uh, it's the 256 gigabyte model, but the amount of storage doesn't actually impact the speed. So don't let anybody fool you thinking that it does. Uh, the amount of storage has nothing to do with how fast the iPad is actually going to be. It's just how much storage you've got. So we'll click audio units and here we can just uh, scroll down. And let's see here. I like to use the limiter from Amazing Noises. I find that it sounds really good, does what I need to do. Um, it also allows me to add a little bit of gentle saturation to uh, my overall mix. And I'm talking really, really gentle. I'm going to set this by default to like point, uh, I don't know, point 13 or point 10 or something. And um, the goal here with the limiter is that it's going to measure the audio input levels and it's going to keep the audio level from going over the zero decibel limit. So if we start pushing, you know, a really high level or maybe we're scrolling through samples and something is a lot louder than we're expecting, it's going to help protect the audio output 
coming out of the iPad so that it doesn't damage our ears, our headphones, or our speakers. I have a separate video on using uh, a limiter like this in Beatmaker 3, and if you're not familiar with this concept, I definitely recommend uh, checking out that video as well. I actually have a, a playlist of over 50 videos uh, and tutorials on Beatmaker 3. I'll put uh, a link to that playlist underneath this video uh, when it's done as well. But we'll go ahead and play here. We can see our input level to the limiter. And we can see over here on the right what amount of attenuation we're getting from the limiter. That means how much over the zero decibel limit is the limiter actually keeping our audio. We don't have any worries now. We can go ahead and maybe bring this level up a little. Check the level on my mixer here. It's a little loud, maybe. Can you guys hear my voice over the audio as the audio continues to get louder today? Hey, 33 people in the chat. All right, thanks for tuning in, everyone. I just want to stress that again, that's the Amazing Noises limiter. I'm not really affiliated with them or anything, that's just the limiter that I really like to use. Go ahead and hit save. Oh yeah, Beathawk is a good one as well. Not the same at all, but definitely um, a, an interesting app. I did spend some time with that some time ago. DMF No Limits, right on. Let's go ahead and get um, a hi-hat in here and start building up that backbeat rhythm, shall we? What we'll do is go back into the samples. Uh, we'll go into imports here, and this is where we've got the samples stored. Um, I can currently hook this uh, iPad up to my PC and use a software called iMazing to get in and drop... Um, samples from my PC uh, into these folders here. So that's um, really, if you're on PC and you want to be able to drag and drop files uh, between your iPad, I definitely recommend uh, that iMazing app. Go ahead and go into the Electronic Sounds folder, which is full of my samples here. And I think maybe I was spending a lot of time yesterday in the Velvet Carbon Techno one. Maybe we'll just go into Reflective here and drums and hats. Fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and play the groove and we'll see if we can scroll through some hi-hat samples and see what we like. Cool. Yeah, it's that seven for me, I think. So we'll make sure that our pads are up here. We're going to go open hat 7 and just drag that arbitrarily wherever we'd like to. Fantastic. Go ahead and bring this gain on this one down just a little tiny bit. I think I'm going to leave this one centered in the panning. And we'll go ahead and hit record. Now, if you're not real keen on tapping things in in real time, the way that we could have punched that in manually would be to go to the third tab down. So we're in our song view. This is the pattern that we're working with. You can see that it's a four bar pattern here on the grid. And we would just double tap on the pattern itself. And then we can go ahead and get in here. And here's our open hat. We could have punched that in manually, you know, whoops, or any other notes that we so desire. If we don't like those, we can just use the undo up here in the top right to take those notes out. I think we'll go ahead and put a high pass filter. Yeah, on that hi hat, just to remove, just to remove any potential sub low frequencies that may be hanging out there that we maybe just can't hear. Make sure those are not coming through. Again, high pass filter. Any sample, I mean any pad that we drag a sample with, we get its own complete editing system. We can even assign like uh, LFOs and modulation to these knobs. We can automate the panning of sounds. We can automate the filter uh, movement of sounds. 
Let's go ahead and bring that hi-hat down just the tiniest little bit more. Go over to our mixing tab and double click that bank. Let me show you that what I mean. Oops, let me show you that what I mean again. In the mixing tab here, which is our fourth tab down, here's our bank one. And our bank one contains all of our samples. So if we double tap on that, it opens up a lane for each individual sample. So we can take a look here and we can, for instance, see that there's no send on our kick drum. We're obviously not going to send our kick drum to a bunch of reverb, but I would like to send some reverb to, onto that hi hat. So let's do that. Go nuts if we wanted, right? But we certainly don't. Just a little bit. Very subtle, maybe. All right. I don't want a huge reverb tail just sort of hanging over it, but for instance, since we've already got the chords inside of their own sort of acoustic space using this reverb, it's kind of nice to get a lot of your other instruments to play in that exact same acoustic space. Let's go ahead and double click that bank tab. And we'll go ahead and click save. Make sure that we get our save on. I'm a chronic over saver, so we make sure that if anything goes wrong, maybe we lose, I don't know, power or the app, you know, the shuts down or something like that, that we've always got um, a save to go back to. Hey, well, all right. We've got a bunch of people in the chat. If I'm missing questions, I apologize. I'm kind of, um, this is a little bit harder to do um, slowly in real time than I was actually expecting. Um, how long have we been going? 46 minutes. We've got a kick, a hi-hat, and some chords. Okay, let's see here. Huh. But that does sound pretty groovy. I like the way that sounds. What let's do next, I think, um, is maybe come up with something to fill the low frequency content out. So maybe like a, some sort of a bass sample. What we can do is um, go back to the section of samples here. And I've got quite a few of my sample packs loaded in here. Um, we could maybe go to bass works. I have just a sample pack that I've got with tons of bass sounds. Um, bass sounds in every uh, root note. So whatever key you're working with, it's a lot easier to get some sounds going, some bass sounds. Let me go ahead and press play, and we'll see if any of these sounds maybe might work. Oh, hold the phone. I like that. Let's do something like that. It's a really low, it's like we've got a lot of, if you can't hear that, put your headphones on. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give that a different color just so we can sort of get a reference that it's a bass sound. Um, and what we'll do, I think, is put a high pass filter on this, but we're going to bring it down really, really low so that we're just removing um, any like really, really sub frequencies. Yeah, maybe a little higher. Cool. So this bass part, let's go ahead and actually look at where this is in the pattern, right? We'll go over to the third section, which is our um, song, our, um, our um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but we're going to get into the pattern here. You can actually see now that if we're coloring the pads differently, that that'll be representative over in this uh, section as well. Okay, I've got an idea for something that we can do to flesh out this bass sound. And well, this is, re I want you guys to focus in on this here because this is really a great feature and why I like the workflow of a sample based workflow inside of Beatmaker 3 so much. If we highlight the pad here while we're in um, the second tab, which gives us some options to work with of the individual pads. We can click the three dots here, and we can click Copy. And we can touch the next pad next to it, click those three dots again, and click Paste. So it's just that easy to make a variation of the sample. 
But Dean, those sound the same is probably what you're saying. But what we can do is we can make any adjustments we want to, and it's only going to be for that sample. So if I want uh, to have a variation of the bass, for instance, that hits, let me zoom in, that doesn't have such a fade in on the beginning, I can just copy that sound over. And then I can make an adjustment. I can just get in here as much as I want. And now we've got one that fades in. Whoops. We've got one that sort of fades in. And then one that is a really... You know what I mean? But we want to make sure that these don't ever play over each other at the same time. The same way that we made the chords not play over each other. But if we were to assign these to the same choke group that the chords are in, all hell will break loose, and that's not what we're after. So we want to make sure we're highlighted on the first sample that we want to, you know, affect, and we're going to put it into choke group number two. Now I'll highlight the second sample that we want to affect, and we'll put that one in choke group number two. And now, one sample will literally cut off or choke the playing of the other sample, and they won't play over each other. little variation on this bass. Cool. Let's make sure we save at this point. Always remember to save. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat that I need to get to. Yeah, no beat maker for iPhone. To be honest with you, this is, um, I can't even imagine trying to use something like this on a screen that small. Um, I know a lot of people really want that. I honestly think that you'll be disappointed if they do, if they do come out with that. Um, I mean, for instance, I mean, th this is going to be like, I, oh my goodness. I mean, I have an Apple Pencil, but I, if this was on a phone, I mean, I, it's pretty much you with the pencil. I don't really even see being able to, to use something. I mean, I, I don't know, guys. I'm not really anticipating this actually making it to the phone. I know they've said that for literally years now, but, but here we are, literally years later, and it's not on the phone. I, I'm not expecting to see this on the phone. Bring that bass sound down just a little bit more. Actually, let's talk about that. Another way that we can adjust these levels is to go to our mixing tab, you know, touch the bank, make sure we're highlighted on it, double tap it to open up an actual track for each individual pad that we've loaded a sample onto. And here we can adjust the levels of sounds that we, if we want to. We can also have access to another section for panning, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't necessarily have to do it inside of the bank at the little gain setting. You can also do it in that mixer tab. Bring that down just a little bit as well. Hold on. Yeah, there's some reverb at the end of this one. And it's coming through at the end of this one as well. And I'd like the reverb to be gone. So I think what we'll do, that's baked into the sample itself. We're not sending it to the reverb in the amp, in the in the mixing section. There we go. Let's go ahead and do the same thing here so that we get rid of this extra reverb at the end of this. We don't really need this for the, our purposes here. What let's do then is click Edit, and let's go put that right where I want it, and click Process. Whoops. We're going to actually not click Process. Where is that Trim button? It's right here on the side. It's always available. So I've got this section of the sample highlighted that I want to keep. I'm in the audio editor. I'll just hit trim. But I want to make sure that we fade out that tiny little edit at the end. 
So I'm going to drag the start point over. Again, this is really like an MPC, a Kai MPC workflow. We're going to click process and we're going to click fade out. It's just that simple. But since we've edited the sample, like before, we're going to go ahead and save the new version of the edited sample. We're going to just click same directory and let's just call this edited base for now. Cool. Now we've got that saved. So we make sure we save our project. Let's go ahead and hear what we've got. Hey, what's happening, Nils? We've got Loops Pool in here. Hey, oh, Nils, again, all right. I'll have to check out your new channel, right on. Hey, hey, Daniel. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. bass down I think just a little more still I never quite know with the bass when we're working on headphones so bear with me click that save button again hmm let's see here I think maybe something that would be interesting is if we were to assign um, some sort of filter movement to some of these chords that we've got uh, here Let's go ahead and start with this one here. It's kind of our main chord, as it were. Fantastic. There's, we're not utilizing uh, the filter on this uh, sample window yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Now remember, each, each sample gets its own set of tools. We've got its own um, envelopes, and we've got its own filter settings. So we just make sure that we're selected the pad we want to work with. And I'm going to select a low pass filter for this pad. And here we can see that we can uh, put some resonance on it if we want to. We can really adjust that in real time with the cutoff knob. But what's really cool is that we can assign some movement to the LFO. By double clicking the LFO, we're going to get a little page here where we can choose what we want to do. We want to modulate this knob. And now we get some really awesome options for how we want to modulate this. This app goes really, really, really deep. I see a lot of people frustrated with it because they think that it's crashing a lot or it's not working for them. But you guys have seen me been working with this now for almost an hour. We've experienced zero crashes and I'm getting in a little bit deep here. We're going to go ahead and click LFO. We're going to click New LFO, and now I've assigned an LFO to do some movement and modulation on that cutoff knob. But we're going to want to adjust exactly how much modulation is happening there. So if we look over here on the tabs at the top, we can go over to the Modulations tab. Here we'll actually see that LFO that I've just put in, and we can adjust the settings on the LFO and how it's actually affecting that sound. What I'll do, go ahead and mute some of these other sounds so that we can maybe just focus in on that particular chord sound and hear what it's doing. I'm going to sync the LFO to the tempo. And we're going to make this a mono LFO instead of a poly LFO. start to hear it now actually getting some effect on the sound we can make it fast right you can hear that it's moving the filter or we can maybe make it subtle right by taking the amount of this LFO down here how we're not affecting it as much now but this isn't really what I'm after I'm not really after that fast wabba wabba type of movement. We want a really slow movement. So I'm going to assign this to eight bars. And we're going to listen real carefully here. I really want it to be free moving but it's kind of not. I'm not really sure why. No, it's still in what I want. Perfect. You hear how we're way down there now? And it's very, very slow amount of movement. That's great. I'm gonna put this to about 70% amount, so it's not quite as much. I think we'll maybe take this uh, speed 
to four bars instead of eight bars. Now we can hear the filter on that pad doing some movement. You can see it actually as a tiny little icon that lights up and sort of shows you how the knob is moving as well, but you probably can't see that over the live stream. All right. So we've got a little bit of extra movement happening on just that one sample. All the other chords will still be the same. Bring everything back in here. Awesome. Just a little bit of extra movement happening on that one particular sound. Now we could go in and take the time to do that exact same thing for all of all, all or as few of the other chord samples as we decided. We could maybe adjust um, those LFO rates to different times so that um, things are being modulated differently and creating a little bit more movement in the mix. Let's go ahead and see here. I think maybe this one here, let's take mute off. Might be a good candidate for this as well. We don't have any filter settings on this second pad, so we'll go ahead and utilize this. We'll select that low pass filter again, turn the resonance up a tiny, tiny bit, and now we can hear what we're doing with the cutoff knob. Cool. I'm going to double click on the cutoff knob, I'm going to say modulate. And I'm going to select LFO. I'll select new LFO. And then we just have to go over to the modulations tab. And we can see the LFO here. So I'll highlight it. We'll click sync. Press play. mute pretty much everything else except for the chord that we're trying to affect so we can really hear what we're doing. Click that LFO here and we'll change this I think to four bars as well. Awesome. That sounds nice. How's that sound at home? Are we doing okay? The low frequency, uh, uh, the, the LFO, the low frequency oscillator, is really a way um, that we can um, use uh, to modulate things. We can use an LFO to actually modulate just about anything we want. We can use it to modulate something like panning. We can use it to modulate in real time the filter or even the volume of a sound. Let's do just that, as a matter of fact. Let's take, we put um, some modulation on these first two chords, but we did it with the filter. Let's go ahead and take mute off and select that third chord. We'll open the second tab, bringing up the sampler window there. So, you know, you can change the, the window depending on what sample you've got selected. Don't forget, you can easily go in, change this, uh, the color on these if you want. Right? So let's say these two are going to be, uh, these three rather, are going to be affected with a different kind of LFO than what we've assigned to those first two. So we'll arbitrarily just toss a different color on those. And what let's do is maybe um, on the panning here, we'll double click the panning knob. And here we get that same type of set of options. We can click modulate. We can click, we can choose to modulate the panning with an LFO or an envelope or a step modulator, or a random sample and hold. I mean, it gets really deep, you guys. But we're going to choose LFO. We're going to choose new LFO. Now, if we go over to the modulations tab, we can see the LFO, and we can adjust it. So, like, if I want to do maybe some fast and subtle panning, we can turn the sync on, and maybe we can bring this to, like, I don't know, 16th notes, right? You can hear that already. 
But it's a little dramatic. And again, I don't know how much of that is coming through the live stream. But what I can do is just adjust the amount of the LFO. And now the amount is going to control how much of that panning do I want to actually get. I really encourage you guys to experiment um, with uh, assigning modulation to the filter or the panning um, or things like that inside of Beatmaker 3. We'll go ahead and save one more time. Um, let's see here. I'm really trying hard to hit 10,000 subs before the end of the year. I'm so close, you guys. I'm like 100 subs away. So if you're watching this stream and you're not currently subbed to the channel, Hey, grab a sub, and drop the, hit, hit that like button, hit that bell button, help me get to that 10,000. We've got just a few more days and there's a chance we might make it. Let's see here. I think what we'll do is maybe try to find a clap sound to help flesh out the rhythm of this groove. Just make sure we hit save uh, one more time. And I'll hit the top button to go back over to the pads view. Again, if you're looking at the app, these four buttons here are the four main navigation buttons to the four main sections you can get into. Lots of the sections have, you know, deeper sections. But if you want to get into the overview, it's the top button on the left. The second button gets you into the sampler view of each individual pad. Let's not forget that we can have not just a limitation of 16 sounds, but we can go all the way up to 128 sounds on every single bank that we're using. The third tab is our song timeline tab, and the fourth tab is our mixing tab. So here we are in the first tab where we can just, you know, check out the sounds that we've already put in here. And we can go ahead and go in, we can just press play and start scrolling for a clap sound. Just using my sample packs today for sound content. Maybe we'll go into um, the drum and bass bonus samples. I think there's a clap in here. Cool. Oh, here's a nice and neat one. Some things, uh, sometimes I like to use two different clap samples. So in the uh, in the measure where the clap's going to hit on the two and the four, every measure, you know, one, two, three, four, that we get sort of um, a call and a response happening uh, if we're using two complementary clap samples. Let me show you what I mean by that. We're going to drag clap one here, and we're going to drag clap two onto the second pad. So these are different sounds entirely. But both of these sounds, I think, really go with the groove here. So I'm going to just hit record and punch these in. But we're going to go back and forth. So we're hitting clap one on the two and clap two on the four. A little bit of call and response. Go ahead and open these windows. Turn the volume on that second clap down a little. Now remember earlier how I was really harping on about the panning and the stereo field? This is a great opportunity to utilize that as well. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate you tuning in, John. We'll see you next time. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the very, very gentle, gentle panning on these claps to give them a tiny little bit more um, stereo width, per se. We're going to pan our first clap, maybe five to the left, and our second clap, maybe five to the right. Now, if we were really dramatic about this and panned it like, you know, 40% to the left, then you'd really, really hear that in the mix, and it might actually throw off the rhythm, but just a tiny, tiny little bit of movement adds up and sort of gives each clap its own space in the mix. Now what let's do, I'm going to hit save there. What let's do is go ahead and utilize the built-in filters again here. We're going to go ahead and assign a high-pass filter to this clap, but we're going to bring it way, way down to maybe like 80 hertz so that there's just 
no possible chance of any super low frequencies maybe hiding out in these sounds that we can't hear. We're going to go ahead and put this one to 80 as well. So we've put that high pass filter on both of the clap sounds. You can't, it shouldn't be enough that we're really um, changing the way that the sound actually sounds. We're just taking care to make sure that there's not um, hidden frequencies that we maybe can't really hear that are uh, can sometimes be um, inside of a sound. Let's give, let's give these new claps a little bit of reverb, shall we? If we go back over to that fourth tab, um, typically it's going to you know look like this, where you've got your main channel, and then however many banks you've got. We've only got one bank so far, so it's only got the one bank. If I double-click that, though, it opens up this window where you can see each of those pads as an actual strip in the mixer. Just going to put a little bit of reverb on those claps here. I love this mixer view so we can, again, we can see each of the individual pads as a channel in the mixer. So we can see that our kick drum here, you know, does not have any reverb on it. But our clap one and our clap two are being sent to send one. Then we have our bass sounds, which have no reverb on them. And then our chords and hats, which have a little bit of reverb on them. Again, as we decide to recolor these pads, I'm a little bit colorblind and I don't always take the time to get in here and do this. But as we take the time to recolor these pads, right, and then when we go into the different sections, you'll see that represented as well. So any track that has a color will be represented here in the mixer. And I want to stress that again, that when you're writing the patterns, when you go in and you're actually working in the piano roll, those colors are representative as well, which makes things quite a bit easier if you do take the time and get in and color your pads so that they're not all the same color. I think um, I think you only have to be over um, either 500 or 1,000 um, subscribers to, to do the monetization where the ads are coming up uh, before your videos. Um, so it's not necessarily a 10,000 thing. Um, it's just really a decision on whether they wanted to try to monetize uh, their channel or not. Currently, I am monetizing my channel, which is why you guys get those quick videos at the beginning. Um, it really helps out the channel. Uh, every little bit helps. I've been building this channel for three years now and we're just about to hit uh, 10,000 subscribers currently my ad revenue brings in about another uh, hundred dollars per se uh, a month which really uh, definitely helps I know it's kind of a pain to have to sit through some of the ads but you know there's not a lot of not a whole lot of ways to, to uh, uh, make money off of the YouTube thing other than, you know, the ads. So we definitely, uh, definitely need those. And sorry that those are, you know, in front of the videos, guys. But yeah, it happens. Um, okay, let's see here. We've got kind of a nice groove built up. Maybe what we could do is... Um, get ourselves some sort of like an impact sound. Uh, for those of you who like to tune into my live streams regularly, you know that I love that impact sound on the downbeat to sort of keep us on the grid. You don't really need to worry about that so much when we're working in a um, like a full DAW where we can actually program everything out. But I really like the way um, that that those type of sounds will cut through. So let's see here. I actually have a folder of Dean's effect sounds, so hopefully we'll find my favorite one that I like to use here. Oh yeah. This is just a, a noise uh, impact burst that I like to use sort of in place of an old school crash cymbal. Um, and it really tends to cut through the mix and just do the job. Um, so we'll go ahead and put a high pass filter on this. I often like to high pass um, on my crashes and impacts. I often like to high pass uh, quite a bit of the low frequency content out of those so that there's no way that they're going to conflict, you know, with the low frequency content of my kicks or basses or whatever. 
So currently we've taken everything. Um, I put a high pass filter on this uh, impact and I've taken all of the low frequency content beneath 1000 Hertz um, off. Let's go ahead and give that its own color real quick, shall we? Just something random. I'm sure this is heinous, sorry about that. Cool, what we can do is we can go ahead and put this in. This is a uh, four bar pattern. Let's go back to our song here. So we just got a four bar pattern, but I don't want this impact to play every four bars. That's gonna get really, really tedious, really, really fast, right? So. One of the ways, uh, earlier we went ahead and doubled the length of the pattern and then I just sort of highlighted the notes and we dragged those out. There's another way here that I'll show you that we can just extend the length of this pattern. If we have it selected, we can go ahead and repeat that pattern just by hitting the repeat button here. We could take our loop brace that's uh, looping every four bars up to an eight bar loop here. But what we can do now is I can use the highlight tool to highlight both of these patterns at the same time. Um, and I can click merge. So I've created a brand new pattern now. And if we go in here, we'll see that here's our full pattern. All of our notes are spread out here and it's a full nine bar pattern. But if we click our window up here, we can see in our patterns that our pattern one is still here and now we've created a second pattern, pattern two. So at any time, we can still get back to that first pattern. And how, you, let's say we've created a bunch of patterns and you want to put them on the song timeline now, right? You can just um, make sure that you're in song instead of pattern, right? So we're in the, it gets a little confusing, but you really do get used to it, um, just like you would get used to working with any other, um, you know, robust DAW. It's like learning Ableton. I mean, there's no get in here and just bust something out in a few minutes. You're going to have to put the time in. Um, you can see, I mean, for instance, here we are over an hour, and I've not loaded any virtual instruments. It's been a sample-based workflow. We're using one bank. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we could approach this. Um, we could have used no samples and tried to do it with only virtual instruments. That tends to create more crashes, which is why uh, I'm a big proponent of the sample-based workflow. Uh, I think I want to talk more about uh, Beatmaker 3 and crashes uh, in a little bit as well. Um, let's see here. But if, so if we have our different patterns open in the window, we can just, you know, grab these patterns and drag them onto the timeline and then move them around as needed. So we still have our original pattern. It wasn't like we um, got rid of that by merging it or anything like that. And now we just have an eight bar pattern. So what I want to do is I just want to put that new uh, crash impact sound on the downbeat only. Now, remember earlier I said sometimes it has trouble populating the names of the pads super quick. It's doing that little thing now. So like if you don't see your new sample here in the sample list, we can just click back to the pad section, right? We can see the pad name. A12, right? So we can just go back in here and we can up oh, and there it is. Sometimes you just have to go back in and out a couple of times for it to actually populate the name in this little window here instead of saying that the pad is empty. But we can actually, uh, there's a little play icon beside every single sample. So you can literally just kind of click on the pads if you want. And if there's anything on that pad, you can hear what it is while you're in this window as well, which is really, really handy. I just want to put that impact down on the very first downbeat there. Why is that not what doing that? Now, this is an anomaly. For some reason, it's not playing the crash, and it doesn't seem to have my cursor going back around or any of that stuff. And 
there definitely are anomalies that can happen sometimes. And this is another one of the reasons why I like to hit that save button way too often. I find that as soon as anything is being a little bit strange, we'll just get our save on, right? I'm just going to close that app out. We'll give it a couple seconds. Maybe take a second and get a little screen wipe here while I'm in the pause, right? And then we'll just open that up again and see if we can't figure out why it was doing that. Open session. And let's see here. We're in... Where's our session today? There it is, BM3W tutorial, load that up, cool. So it didn't have a problem loading any of our samples, that's still there. But it doesn't want to play it, does it? I'm not sure why, that's, hmm. Because you can see that there's the note on the, and when I hit the, Is it this? It was that. Okay, let's discuss that for a second. Um, sometimes it gets confused. Okay, I'm really glad this happened so that I can explain this. Sometimes it gets confused what pattern it thinks you want to play because you've been selecting these over here and maybe doing your drag and drop. And it gets a little bit confused in the... Um, uh, I can't think of this word all of a sudden, but what you want to do is you see how the pattern is a little bit grayed out looking. If we tap into it, we can still get into the pattern, but if we go back to our song mode, it's kind of grayed out looking. What we want to do is see there's these little t little tiny playheads over here at the right. We just want to click that again, and it's going to put it back into like it knows now that we're in the the song mode and it's no longer highlighted and it's playing that sample. <laughs> A little bit odd, and I think I did a lousy job explaining that, but just uh, these little playheads over here, if your patterns ever get grayed out and aren't quite playing as expected, those playheads on the right will absolutely fix that. Fantastic. So, let's go to the mixer, and let's put a little reverb on that noise impact sound, shall we? Two, three, four. All right. Okay, let's see here. I'd like to talk a little bit about Beatmaker 3 and why it crashes for some people, and that can be really, really frustrating. You can see that we've had a couple of anomalies along the way today, but there were no crashes. And now, one of the reasons why an app like Beatmaker 3 can crash, and I really want you to focus in on what I'm saying here, is that, let's say, like, the last update for this app, okay, has been at least a couple of months ago, maybe three, four, I don't remember exactly how long, and it was a minor update, like the colors, I think, were part of it. Um, now, any applications that come out since an update of an app are likely to have things in them that might not be compatible with pre-existing code. Now, what does that mean exactly? Let's take a, a, a look at who's actually coding the majority of apps for iOS first, right? These are individual people. These are not necessarily large corporations that you see on desktop producing plugins, okay? These are small independently run companies. Often there's like one person doing the coding for these apps, right? So let's say that, you know, person who's making a new synthesizer app forgets one tiny little thing in their code, right? Like maybe one zero is out of place, maybe a one is out of place, right? And maybe if you're using that app as a standalone app and you're, you know, not pushing it real hard, maybe everything's fine. But maybe if you load that app into Beatmaker 3, 
Maybe something that Beatmaker 3 is trying to do with that synthesizer triggers that missing zero, and suddenly we have a crash, right? Well, that crash isn't necessarily Beatmaker 3's fault. It could be that there's something missing from the code from the developer, right? Now, the developer can fix that, or Beatmaker 3 can get updated, or that's how things work on desktop, right? There's updates to Ableton all the time as new plugins come out all the time and Ableton is working with all of these companies and people are sending Ableton bug reports and making sure that everything works as expected. It's not quite so much the same on iOS and we get a lot of different developers and mostly independent developers who have small or no beta testing teams are putting out these apps. Now, if I load, let's say, two or three apps that have been programmed by, say, an individual developer who's maybe got one tiny, tiny error in that app that somewhere along the line, we, we, we get updates to apps all the time. You guys know that there's definitely bugs in pretty much every piece of software that exists at some point or another. So if we're now loading in two or three different synthesizers that might each have maybe one tiny, tiny percentage of something going wrong, we've now you know, raised the expo exponentially raised the potential for there to be something going wrong. The more apps we load in at the same time, the more synthesizers, the more effects that we load in, especially from different companies at different levels of professionalism, the more likely we are to get crashes. Now, You'll notice today that I didn't load any virtual instruments inside of Beatmaker 3. It's just been loading samples onto the pads. And that is exactly how I always work inside of Beatmaker 3. Sometimes I do load an instrument into it, and I'll create a part with that instrument. But as soon as the part has been created, I will go ahead and render that to audio. And then we'll drag that audio in onto a pad the same way that I've done here. And I will delete that virtual instrument. I won't actually save the session with a bunch of virtual instruments inside of it. And th that's exactly why. Let's say an app gets updated, but say some other apps don't get updated. And you're trying to load a session now that maybe you've made six months ago or a year ago. And half the apps have gotten updates and half the apps don't. And maybe some zeros and ones are still conflicting. And you've just got that much more potential for a crash. If we're just using samples and we're not you trying to load a whole bunch of instruments, at the same time and use a whole bunch of you know code from different people who are all coding individually there's a whole lot less potential for crashes and i really just don't experience them and i encourage you to give beatmaker 3 a go and if you're loading virtual instruments into it render that stuff to audio you don't necessarily need to load it back to pads like this you can just take a piece of audio and drag it directly onto the timeline let's say if we were going into the imports folder and electronic sounds right maybe we were looking for a loop or something so here's like some effects loops and let's say we were making a song this way right I can just, whoops, I would need to, um, we would need to add a track, we would, not an auxiliary track, rather, but an audio track on the timeline, right? And then we could just drag anything we want, just right onto that audio track. We could grab different loops, anything we want. So we can really work um, in the timeline with loops and sounds, but I really prefer to, uh, rather than load things to different tracks on the timeline, to just load them to a different pad in the bank. So here we have three loops that we've just, you know, dropped onto the timeline. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna long press on this and delete, okay? So we're back to just our one bank again. I can do the same thing, right? I can even, um, I could go up to another section if I wanted to, but we don't need to, we've got room. I could take a loop here, Okay, whoops, it's a little loud maybe, and not quite. By default, when you drag something onto a pad and you hit the pad, it's gonna play that sample in its entirety. But if you don't want it to, you know, behave that way, all we do is go down to the layer trigger 
and change that from a one shot to a hold. Now, if we want to put that in our track, all we have to do is go ahead and open up our pattern. And let's say I wanted that to, let's say, you know, it was the same tempo as our groove. It's not, you know, but let's say that it was. All we have to do is just drag it out to hold that note for as long as we want to hold that note. See how the other notes are just little notes. We're just working with little sounds. But if we put a loop on a pad, all we have to do is just, you know, extend this out to hold that sound as long as we want to. It's really, really easy to work with um, once you get used to it, a sample-based workflow like this and just dropping your sounds onto the pads. Let's say we don't want that there. Um, uh, we can go uh, clear pad and just get rid of that sound. Um, let's see, we've been going for almost 90 minutes today. I'm gonna head back over to the chat here. I know it's been a lot of talking and I really appreciate that. Uh, looks like there's 35 of you who stuck with me. Thank you very much uh, for, t for tuning in and sticking with everyone. I'll see if there's any questions maybe uh, that I missed. Um, and if you had a question and it got missed, please drop it in uh, again and I will go ahead and try to answer that for you at this time. Yeah, half of commercial software development budget is for debugging. I can't stress that kind of concept enough. That is amazing, Nick. That's exactly the kind of information that I'm talking about here. Like these little companies just don't have that kind of time. And, you know, we are the beta testers for the most part as, as we find these bugs and we report them to the companies. Um, if you want, you know, less less bugs and less crashes, uh, but you really need to use instruments and not a sample-based workflow, I would say, um, you know, definitely try to use the instruments from like a larger company that might have, um, you know, a, 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 a more robust uh, budget for like beta testing and finding those bugs and or fixing those bugs. Um, I know we don't, you know, really get a lot of updates with BeatMaker 3, but, you know, to be honest with you, in the state that it's in now, I find it 100% usable for making live jams or making full finished tracks as well. I'm just kind of scrolling back in the chat here to see if I miss anything. Hey, Jim, thanks for tuning in. What iPads? Um, To be honest with you, um, any iPad, really. I started out with an iPad Air 2, um, and that works with BeatMaker 3 as well, especially if you're using uh, a sample-based workflow and not loading a bunch of instruments. Um, and the more um, you know, instruments and effects we try to load, the more taxing that will be on the CPU. Um, but if we're working... Um, like with samples and whatnot, even those you know lower iPads will definitely get you there. I've got um, a couple of iPad Air 2s that I used for quite some time uh, with BeatMaker 3 uh, and the sample-based workflow, and those work really well. Um, I would say that's probably, if you're looking to get like a used iPad to get into this, I would say the iPad Air 2 is probably the oldest you want to go um, because that one can still uh, be updated uh, and it still works pretty pretty well with things like this. Um, is OM or BM3 better for jamming? Well, I think that depends um, on what specifically you'd like to do. If I had to pick one um, as like a deeper than the other, oh man, they're really similar in the fact that you can get in and automate just about whatever you want. And you can take like, you know, a MIDI controller or something and you can assign your knobs um, to things in BeatMaker 3 and you can do the same thing in ARM. Um, one definite benefit to BeatMaker 3 though is that we can use the scenes mode. If we're using, um, especially rather, if we're using a one bank workflow like we've created today, I just loaded one bank and we've just been loading samples onto the pads. We don't have a bunch of instruments. We don't have a bunch of separate banks with sounds on them. Just one bank. This is a really easy way to build a live jam because we can go into scenes mode on BeatMaker 3, which works a lot like Ableton. If we click on the little tab over here where it says playing song, it's gonna allow us to choose our patterns. 
and we've created two patterns. And we can create little scenes inside of Beatmaker 3, which if you're familiar with Ableton Live, it works just like the scenes do in Ableton Live. We can go ahead and take like another pattern here, and I can drag it onto that scene. If I had more patterns, I could drag, you know, say if I had an intro, a verse, a chorus, you know, a breakdown, something like that. I could just drag those onto the scenes, right? Now, if I go back to the pads mode and I click over here, scene, it allows us to, uh, in real time, play these scenes back. So if I press the button, sorry, it's going to get loud. Right? So we're letting the pattern play. In one, two, Let's change it. Now it goes to pattern two. Let's change it. Now we're playing pattern three. So in real, I know it's a little bit difficult because these scenes are all the same, but if I had, you know, a breakdown here and I had the intro here and we had a chorus here and the patterns had a lot of differences in them as opposed to just the two we've built, you'd hear a lot more of the changes here. And you can use this scenes mode to arrange like a live jam in real time. So if you've got, let's say, some things in your bank assigned to some knobs and stuff, you've got like maybe a filter here on the bass line, you've got maybe the volume of the kick drum on the second pad, maybe you've got um, the panning of a sound here on a knob or whatnot, you can go through and you can play the scenes and you can kind of arrange in real time as you're doing those modulation things and tweaking knobs in real time as well. And that way you actually get uh, that whole ebb and flow in your live jam really easily. For instance, in Om, it's not necessarily quite as easy to create what we're considering to be scenes to where you're going to get back to one specific section of the groove with just the press of one button. You can certainly assign your MIDI controller in Om um, to the different knobs, to the volumes. Um, I find uh, the Novation Launch Control uh, MIDI controllers are really good for that. This one's probably a bit dusty. I think the, the Launch Control XL, the larger version of this, is uh, my favorite uh, MIDI controller to use um, with OM. And this, you know, you got the sliders at the bottom of that one. You can use the buttons to assign to mute tracks on and off. Uh, so there's definitely some awesome jamming to be had in OM as well. See if there's any other questions. Yeah, exactly, Michael. It just depends on how you want to work. Exactly. A bonus to using Om, uh, doing that kind of stuff as well. I have a video on this if you haven't seen it, um, and that's how to actually make perfectly timed loops inside of Om. So if you've created a bunch of tracks and you want to easily just kind of export those out individually so that you can bring those pieces of audio into another app, maybe like Beatmaker 3 to work with or something, um, that that's really doable as well. Um, if you missed that one, be sure to check out um, my video. I'll, I'll see if I can't put a, a link under this one to that as well, because it's a really great, uh, like a game changer for using OM. Um, um, yeah, for sure. Hey, OB Shaky, thanks for tuning in. Right on. Ooh, are we talking about programming? I don't know how to do any programming. So I think that's probably going to do it today, unless there's any last-minute questions coming in. Let's see. We've been going for about an hour and 40 minutes today. We've got kind of this fun groove going. Let's see, to create scenes and arm. Um, yeah, imagine it, uh, Imaginando LK, um, which is an Ableton clip-like launcher. That is a fantastic-looking app. I actually have it, um, and I'm really excited to check that out. The LK. Um, Clip launcher. Yeah, that looks really amazing to allow you to turn OM into um, a thing with scenes, pretty much just like this. Uh, there's never enough hours in the day, but definitely that one looks like it's going to be something really, really special. I need to check that out. Thanks for bringing that up again. I appreciate that, Michael. Do you do projects with more than one bank? Now, I do. It de Let me explain that a little bit about the one bank and why um, that's a thing. Um, 
Let me get out of scenes mode here, and just we get the regular view back. Basically, um, I can go into any of these knobs, right, and I can assign them to um, a knob on a MIDI controller. We can assign um, up to 16 knobs on a MIDI controller, and we can have them do anything we want, basically, uh, to these sounds. We can um, we can make it so when we turn a knob, it changes something on the effects. We can have it uh, change a filter, all sorts of options. But here's the anomaly there. Beatmaker 3 only allows you to do that with one bank at a time. So for instance, if I assign, let's say on the bank that we've created here, if I assign, let's say, some filter movement on this bass sound, right, to a knob, so where when I move the knob, it, you know, messes with the filter. Cool, right? Awesome. That's perfect. We can go in, we can do the scenes mode, and the knob will always know that when I move it, you know, you should tweak that filter. But as soon as I load a second bank, let me get out of scenes mode there. As soon as I load a second or even a third bank, now it depends on which bank you are on as to which of the knobs are controlling. Beatmaker 3 um, has you assign your knobs to what they consider macros. And the macros only work on one bank at a time. And that's the anomaly. Is that, let's say I have a bank of drum sounds on bank one. It's all the drums, right? Awesome. Kick drums and claps and hi-hats and rides and shakers, all that good stuff, right? And we've programmed the drums and maybe we've, you know, taken the time to make it so when we roll a knob that lots of neat things happen with the drums. Maybe some sounds change volume. Maybe some sounds change pitch. All kinds of fun stuff, right? Well, the jam is playing, and maybe we've got some bass sounds over here. And maybe I'd like to filter the bass at the exact same time that I'm tweaking a knob to do something else. That's where the anomaly comes in. Beatmaker 3 doesn't allow you to do that. It only allows you to control the currently selected bank. It doesn't allow me to go into the mixer tab and assign any of my knobs to any of the levels or anything at all in the mixer section. It only allows you to assign things to the currently selected bank. And that is why I use a one bank workflow because you can just drop samples onto pads and you can just drop effects onto those pads individually so we can EQ any of the pads individually or send any of the pads to the effects individually as we need to. But as soon as we start getting more banks involved, let's say I have my drums on bank one and I'm adjusting those and I'm jamming out and I'm having a good time, I literally have to click over to bank three and now I won't be adjusting the drums. I'll only be adjusting what I've assigned on bank three. And if I want to adjust the drums again, I've got to click back over here to bank A. You can even actually assign the controllers, um, the buttons on your controller to switch between the banks. So like bank A, bank B, bank C. But then you've got to remember that. Okay, I want to you know, mess with the drums. So bank one and then this and that. And now I want to do the bass. So bank three and then the... And that's definitely doable. But it's a level of like thinking that I don't want to have to do uh, when I'm in real time on a live jam. If I can just have everything to where when I assign the controller, it's always here no matter what, whether it's a volume or a filter or a pan or a tuning change or anything, that it's just always going to be there. I find that if I have to change a bank and then turn a knob, it's just it gets me out of uh, the workflow entirely. I actually have a video where I talk about my my one bank workflow um, idea, basically what we did today. Um, but I go into depth, uh, into depth and detail uh, on that. And we talk about, you know, how to set up the scenes like I've done here today as well. I was actually hoping to get a little bit further into programming a groove. Um, but I really was trying to keep this as beginner friendly as possible today. I think we've got a pretty good groove built though. That's a fantastic question, Sky Tortoise Ferryman. Thank you very much for that. Let me show you guys uh, that as well, because that is another thing that is really fantastic. Any sample that you drop on, 
you can just play the sample. Let's say you want to play this sample melodically. You don't want to just hit one note, right? Well, up here, you just choose keys. Once you've selected the sample that you'd like to play melodically, you hit keys, and now we're playing that sample melodically. And what we can do is we can even go in and we can set scales to things like this. Let's see here. If we go in whoops, to scales, we can choose like a major scale or any kind of scale that we like. I really like to work with the minor pentonic scale. And we're in the key of F minor. So I can get this keyboard layout into the key of F minor pentonic. If I just set the root note down here at the corner to an F, if I click this octave button, now it says semitone. And I can just move these around, these notes around, until we get an F at the bottom left. This is your root note. And then whatever scale you've got you, you know, chosen is what it's going to lock those notes into. So here we're into an F minor pentonic scale. And you can adjust these scales as needed, and you can take them in and out of the keys mode as needed as well. So for instance, here's our very first chord, and as we play it, you know, tap it on the screen, it just plays the root note. But if I've got it selected and I hit keys, So you can definitely create melodic parts with any sample that you load into the pads as well. If we get into the 64 pads mode, we can really, um, let's see here, get that wide range. The black notes, uh, not the black notes, but the darker notes that we see here are exactly that. Those are the black notes on the keyboard. So you've got a little bit of difference uh, here that you can see whether you're hitting the white notes or the, you know, the dark notes. And all you have to do is select the key that you want to play melodically and then hit keys. And now you can play that one melodically. So that's neat as well if you want to do some fine tuning on your percussion. Like maybe you want to change the pitch that the kick drum is playing back at. Maybe make it lower, make it higher, or do some fine tuning on that. You just get into the keys mode and any of these sounds you can play melodically. Let's take a look at the chat one last time. I use iRig pads. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Korg Nano Key Studio Novation Launchpad. Absolutely. Yeah, that machine MK3 looks pretty magic. Are you having fun with that? Is it playing the sounds from Massive pretty well? I was interested in that. Like, That's pretty special to be able to get uh, the Massive synthesizer inside of a hardware box so where you can really get access to the quality of those sounds. But in hardware without the computer, oh my gosh, forget about it. That's magic right there. Absolutely. I will definitely try to get some more Beatmaker 3 content uh, up on the channel. It's just there's never enough hours in the day to do all of the things that I would really like to do. Um, I just want to remind everyone who's still hanging out on the chat that I'll be doing um, this really big live stream on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's going to be a 20-minute-ish um, live set with the modular system. Um, I've got the Virus Dark Star involved. I've got the uh, Quasi-Midi Revolution involved as well, and it should be a fun one. That's what I've been doing uh, with most of my time for the past couple of weeks is working on that, and that's why we're not um, doing a Eurorack live stream today. Um, Ooh, Cobalt 8 soon. All right, Nels, that's nice. Those are absolutely gorgeous looking synthesizers from Model. Absolutely. There was um actually a, a live stream where somebody was chatting with Nick Bat and they did a whole um sort of focus on that thinking about um like are are those Model synthesizers really popular because they're so gorgeous because they really are gorgeous my god okay um i really appreciate everyone tuning in uh, again this week and uh next week i think we'll probably be back to another euro rack patch lab uh because i'll be done with that live stream um so i guess that's going to do it and i really appreciate everyone tuning in we will see you soon take care everyone